Her film career spanned 30 years, yet she appeared in just 19 feature films. But each role radiates a different facet of her talent. That talent earned her two Academy Awards. Her life with one of the greatest actors of our time made her the center of attention for millions, even as she endured repeated illness. And today, so long after her death, she remains somehow elusive, never to be fully known or truly understood. But still we are enchanted by her and by the wonderful mix of beauty and art she brought to her films. And most of all, by her performance in perhaps the greatest woman's role ever on film, Scarlett O'Hara in Gone with the Wind. We knew her as Vivian Lee. When I was a kid growing up in Minnesota, I fell in love with the story Gone with the Wind, and of course with Scarlett O'Hara. It's a rare phenomenon when an actor can so completely possess a role that it becomes impossible to ever imagine anyone else playing that part. And Vivian Lee did this. To me, she represented everything being an actress could mean and all the magic that it could bring. She said an aspect of her own personality showed in every part she played. Adoring Cynthia in Fire Over England, coquettish Elsa in A Yank at Oxford, loyal Myra in Waterloo Bridge, tempestuous Scarlet, and fragile doomed Blanche. Vivian Lee was all of these, and because she was also such a fine actress of the stage as well as the screen, she was much, much more. No one I don't think has ever been as beautiful. But, yes, she had, as an actress, to fight against it, to be taken seriously. And I think she was never taken seriously enough because she was so beautiful. She was obsessed with work, not particularly with being a star. I don't think she was thinking about that very much. She had this appreciation for, the, for everything that life had to offer. Great intensity, as if she knew her life was going to be short and she was going to get it all in um, as well as she could in, in the few years that were going to be allotted to her. Well, I don't care what you expect or what they think. I'm going to dance and dance. Tonight I wouldn't mind dancing with Abe Lincoln and Sam. Vivian Mary was born to Gertrude Hartley in 1913 in India where Ernest Hartley was a prosperous stockbroker. The Hartleys made the most of life in colonial India, and they doted on their only child. There were plenty of servants, and always ample opportunity for pleasure. Ernest especially enjoyed amateur theater. And he was proud of three-year-old Vivian's first performance when she announced to the audience that instead of singing Little Bo Peep, she intended to recite it. But the days with her fun-loving father did not last. Gertrude decided that what Vivian needed was a proper English education. When she was only six, she became a boarder at the Sacred Heart Convent in Roehampton, near London. The Hartleys remained in Calcutta, thousands of miles away. But if Vivian pined for her parents, she learned to conceal it. Her love of fantasy was expressed in school plays and she soon became one of the convent's most popular students. She was 15 when her parents returned to England to settle. Then it was Europe for more schooling and travel with time out for fun. Vivian was discovering the world. She was an accomplished linguist. She spoke 
French without an accent of any kind. She spoke Italian beautifully. And she was very much from the English upper class, genteel school of behavior. She fell in love with a German boy and she told her mother she wanted to marry him. And her mother said, that's idiotic, Vivian, you're only 17 years old. And she said, but mommy, if you don't let me marry him, nobody else will ever ask me. Two years later, Vivian married Lee Holman. He was a barrister of independent means and 12 years her senior. Lee Holman was a tolerant man, and he enjoyed Vivian's bright enthusiasms, even if they did center on her ambition to act. When she was accepted into the Royal Academy of Dramatic Arts, he saw it as a kind of finishing school. She was still only 19 when Suzanne was born. The birth was difficult and premature, and Vivian was happy to get back to the Royal Academy. Within months, an agent had found Vivian's small film parts, nothing too demanding, but it was a start. Then she changed her name to Vivian, with an E, and took leave from her husband. She was now Vivian Lee. I think I saw it in a play with Ivan Novello called The Happy Hypocrite, at His Majesty's, in which she played the little girl and was very sweet. At first, I believe they didn't think that she was a tremendously talented. Her voice was a little bit thin. But she looked rather muffin-faced, I thought, and a bit round-cheeked, and nothing like the beauty that she was later. Do you love me more now that we're here together than you did last week when we weren't here together? The 1935 Look Up and Laugh. Why didn't you it was one of Vivian's first films. She was judged charming, pretty, but not much more was expected of her. Then she appeared in a stage production, The Mask of Virtue. She became an overnight sensation. Alexander Corda offered her a film contract, and she was seen by Laurence Olivier. Olivier was already well established, with a theatrical career ranging from Noel Coward to Shakespeare. When Vivian first saw him act, she knew immediately that she wanted to appear on stage with him. She also vowed that one day she would become his wife. It was only natural that she would fall for him, and it was even more than natural that he would fall for her. It was a, um, a, a coupling made in heaven, I think, at that particular time. Except for the fact that he was married to someone else, she was married to someone else. They each had at least one child when that happened, further complicating the situation. And so the, uh, the love affair was indeed a troubled one. Yes, my darling. In 1937, Fire Over England was their first film together. And it seemed to them to be a celebration of their own real feelings. I'll come back. And then they really were madly in love, both of them. So that it should. The Queen sends you home in disgrace. I'll come with you and be disgraced too. Dear. Why foolish? You love me, don't you? Well then, that all? I can't. But we've a right to be happy. Everyone's a right to be happy, Michael. Everyone, yes. That is why we can't be. She was determined, but then so was Larry, that she should be a star. Michael. And in fact, I remember him once saying, of course we have in the way. very early days, I would never love anybody who wasn't really talented. And of course she was. You've been to Paris? Yes. Doing what? Finishing school. Uh -huh. Finished being finished? Yes. Good. Her talent for light comedy was well established by the time she appeared with Rex Harrison in Storm in a Teacup. You've got yourself into a nice mess, haven't you? Oh, well, something. Never mind that. What are you going to do? Looking another job, I suppose. If you can get one. And what are you going to do in the meanwhile? You got any money at all? Yes. No, thanks. You may need them. 
A romance with Olivier was now common knowledge, but Lee Holman refused to divorce her. He thought the infatuation would soon pass. And though Vivian's passion for Olivier was now central to her life, her focus was still on her career. Vivian was applauded for her rendition of the flirtatious Elsa opposite Robert Taylor in the 1938 A Yank at Oxford. My husband and I keep a bookshop. You don't look like you belong in a bookshop. Oh, I sometimes manage to steal away and forget it. But then, of course, my husband's much older than I am. I, I mean that I'm much younger than he is. Oh, I'll bet he doesn't understand you, does he? Oh, well, I wouldn't say that. He just forgets every so often that, well, that I'm young and that I need excitement. <laughs> I've never loved anyone but you. I'll never love anyone again. Oh, no, Elsa, no, don't say that. <laughs> it's be... true, Paul. I shall always be faithful to the memory of our love. Always. <laughs> I, I beg your pardon. Were you looking for something special? Later that year, Vivian again won good notices for her performance as a Cockney street entertainer opposite Charles Lawton in St. Martin's Lane. Who are you? Libby. From Liberty. From the Statue of Liberty in New York Harbor. What you do? I'm a dancer, I am. And artist, right? Like to hear me? There's a one-eyed yellow monster to the north of Kathmandu. There's a little something... More than flesh and blood can stand. But I've been out late before. Well, it's the last time. We've got to have a totally new arrangement. You in this room and me up there. Charles, there ain't going to be any more new turns. I'm going on the stage. The agent of Mr. Prentice is fixing it all up. I told you I'd get there. I told you. Vivian had come a long way from Little Bo Peep in Calcutta, India. She had appeared in ten films, in ten plays, but she was still not much recognized outside England. And then she heard of the search for a star for the movie version of Margaret Mitchell's best-selling novel. The setting was the American Civil War, the heroine, a southerner born and bred. Vivian Lee had never even been to the United States, and her natural accent was the purest upper-class English. But the role was the most coveted in the history of movies, and Vivian Lee decided to make it her own. And so she prepared to take Hollywood by storm. Even as Europe was about to burst into flames with World War II, in Hollywood, where war could still be fantasy, old sets on a back lot were burned for a scene for one of the most spectacular movies ever made, Gone with the Wind. It is now part of legend that against the unforgettable backdrop of Atlanta on fire, David O. Selznick first caught sight of Vivian Lee. And Vivian had it planned perfectly. She looked radiant, and Selznick was bowled over. He was overwhelmed by the determination of this lovely, delicate, fragile uh, English girl to play the part of a southern heroine. She was, I'm told, the 244th girl who tested for the part in Gone with the Wind. But after testing everybody imaginable, she was un there, was, there was no um, possibility of another choice. It was just it. I remember Gone with the Wind with uh, great joy. I was in high school at the time in Miami Beach, Florida, and we were taken out of school for the afternoon to see the film. And my mother took me to see Gone with the Wind when I was a, a little girl. I was born in 1939, which is the year that Gone with the Wind was made. So you can imagine how many times my mother had seen it by the time she took me to see it. She was just perfect, absolutely marvelous. Fiddle easy. Whoa, whoa, whoa. This war talk spoiling all the fun at every party this spring. I get so bored I could scream. Frank, how would you like to drive 
me out to my Aunt Pity. Oh, Red, won't everyone be jealous? I want everybody who's been mean to me to be pea green with envy. <laughs> Vivian was so utterly feminine, so fragile looking. Sometimes you felt that if you touched her, she was going to crack like very fine porcelain. Uh, but that was also deceptive. She was very, she was as tough as a nut in, in many other ways. Great Paul! I'm in my pretty head now. I'm going to land for that $300, and I've got to go looking like a queen. Keep the... boiling water in the kettle. Hello. Give me the ball of twine and, and all the king towels you can find and, and the scissors. I'm going to make friends with the Yankee carpetbaggers, and I'm going to beat them in their own game, and you're going to beat them with me. Never mind about loving me. You're a woman sending a soldier to his death with a beautiful memory. Scarlet, kiss me. Kiss me. Once. You know down cardly, nasty thing, you. They were right. Everybody was right. You you aren't a gentleman. It was a great acting performance. She wasn't a spoilt girl. She wasn't um a haughty girl. She wasn't cruel. Girl, she wasn't any of those things, actually. She was a terrific woman, and she was a wonderful actress and played a marvelous role wonderfully well. 26-year-old Vivian Lee had so successfully inhabited the character of Scarlet that she made it her own. And in one swoop, she created millions of adoring fans. But meanwhile, the one person she really longed to be with was 3,000 miles away. The first time I met Vivian Lee was on the set of Gone with the Wind, just when the picture was starting. Although she had romped off with the most coveted role in screen history, she was very miserable because Larry was in New York, and she missed him so dreadfully that one day she got David Selzy to let her come to New York and see a matinee of, of No Time for Comedy. And during the intermission, she went back to see Larry, and they clasped each other and clung to each other so that you'd think it was the farewell scene from Romeo and Juliet. In 1940, Vivian again appeared opposite Robert Taylor in the romantic love story, Waterloo Bridge. Of all the films she made, this one was her favorite. Dear, what can it be that is so terrible? Has there been someone else? Oh, Lady Margaret, you are naive. Myra? Yes, yes, yes. Myra? Yes, that thought which is now in your mind, which you are telling yourself can't be true, is true. Although the tragedy of World War II had by now engulfed Europe, for Vivian Lee, 1940 was a bright and significant year. She received the Academy Award for Best Actress for Gone with the Wind, and Lee Holman finally agreed on a divorce with one condition. He was to get custody of their daughter, six-year-old Suzanne. And then actress Jill Esmond divorced Laurence Olivier. While they waited for their divorces to become final, Olivier and Vivian staged their own version of Romeo and Juliet and lost their entire $60,000 investment. But happier events lay ahead. I was spending an evening with Catherine Hepburn because I was interested in getting her to do a movie. When the phone rang, and it was Larry Olivier. And he said, I want you to come downstairs in five minutes. And I said, no, I can't do that. And he said, you have to. It's a matter of life and death. Well, that sounded important enough to me. And I said, where are we going? And he said, we're going to Santa Barbara. 
Well, quite a long drive. I, I said, Santa Barbara, what for? He said, we're going to be married. And off we drove. And within five minutes, these two great lovers on their way to the nuptials were having a knockdown, drag out, screaming fight. And what it was about was the fact that he had lost his way and he was on the wrong road. And so they scrapped and they battled and called each other names until we got on the right road. But the romance grew to almost uh, uh, unbelievable fiery tension between the two of them. The romance of classic proportions. The following year, Vivian achieved another of her ambitions. The Olivier's made their first film together as husband and wife. The 1941 Bat Hamilton Woman. Now I've kissed you through two centuries. 1800. The beginning of a new life for me. A life without you. How beautiful was the old century when I was with you. Her passion for Larry was was equal, if not superior, to her, her ambition. Say that you could never leave me. I can never leave you. But she wanted Say that you hate the to come up to his expectations, what he wanted of her. Want to see the Sphinx. I never want to see the Sphinx. We'll go back to London together. I would have died if you'd left me here. Her dreams had all come true. She'd married the man she loved, they were the golden couple of the theater, and the future looked brilliant. And for a while, it seemed as if nothing could ever come between them again. Back in England, the war dragged on. Suzanne had been sent to safety in Canada with her grandmother. Meanwhile, Olivier joined the Royal Air Force as a transport pilot. And while he waited for assignment, he and Vivian did their bit for the war effort. <laughs> Among others present for the ceremony was the famous screen and stage actor, Lawrence Olivia, and also his wife, Vivian Lee, who also had a few words to say to the microphone. And I'd like to wish that the boys who fly in this plane will have the greatest good luck always. In fact, I hope that you all will, always. Olivier encouraged Vivian to accept a role in George Bernard Shaw's The Doctor's Dilemma. The play was a great success and ran for over a year. And the actor who was playing the, uh, the painter, Dubedat, was taken ill, and the understudy was not able to play for some reason. And they brought me in overnight almost to play the part for a week. And I quickly said I would do it because I was anxious to meet her, and we became great friends through that. And then I used to go and stay with her and Olivier in the country in Buckinghamshire in their beautiful house. Notley Abbey was a 13th century estate that had once been owned by Henry V, the very king that Laurence Olivier was bringing to life in his new film. The Oliviers fell in love with the huge old house, and Vivian set about creating the most perfect home imaginable. She was utterly generous. She loved to give parties. She knew a great many people, probably everyone in the theater, I should think. And the first time I ever went to Notley Abbey, I'll never forget it because at the table there was Dame Margot Fontaine and Judy Garland and Orson Welles. No one I've ever known knew more about food and wine uh, than she did. And a uh, little notepad by her place at table that she would write down anything that wasn't quite perfect in the dinner that had to be seen to afterwards. And the great thing of a hostess is to ask interesting questions and to draw people out and make you feel that you're of interest too. She did. In 1944, soon after they first set eyes on Notley Abbey, Vivian started work on Shaw's Caesar and Cleopatra. She had yearned for the role of the playful princess who must transform herself into a reigning monarch. A divine child. You must get up at its side and creep round. I am a queen at last. A real, real queen. Cleopatra, the queen. Oh, I love you for making me the queen. Is it sweet? 
sweet or bitter to be a queen, Cleopatra? Bitter. Cast out fear, and you will conquer Caesar. When I was foolish, I did what I liked. Now that Caesar has made me wise, it is no use my liking or disliking. I do what must be done and have no time to attend to myself. This is not happiness, but it is greatness. Conditions during the filming of Caesar and Cleopatra were made especially difficult due to the frequent buzz bomb attacks and the intense damp cold. After falling on the set, Vivian suffered a miscarriage. And there were still other problems. About this time, ominous signs of emotional illness began to appear. Her thing was to stay up all night, which was a great deal of the trouble for her and Larry, because he could never sleep. There was no stopping her. And that was the terrible thing. She was so relentlessly energetic. She used to say to me, Rachel, come on, let's go and have a game of canasta. I don't want to go to bed. The pace of Vivian's life began to accelerate. And in 1945, she accepted yet another stage role. The first time I ever saw Vivian on stage was in uh, The Skin of Our Teeth in London. Uh, Thornton Wilder's play. And uh, she was marvelous. Well, she played a kind of comic maid, and she was very frisky. She, it was a very witty, rather throwaway performance, which I admired very much, and people loved it. It was while she was appearing in Skin of Our Teeth that Vivian's physical health finally gave out. She was forced to withdraw from the play when tuberculosis was diagnosed. And she would never take any care when she got TB the first time. She went off down to Notley. She was told she'd got to rest, stay in bed, or even go to a home for a bit. She said, no, I won't. I'm going to plant daffodils, and did all the time. Vivian hoped to play Ophelia in Olivier's film of Hamlet. But Olivier felt a younger woman would be more appropriate for the part. Instead, Vivian starred in a movie version of Tolstoy's Anna Karenina with Ralph Richardson. What are you going to do with those letters? I shall divorce you and obtain the custody of Sergei. You cannot take Sergei from me. With these letters, I can. You cannot take him from me. You don't love him as I do. He's mine. I couldn't bear it. Tell me. Has anyone ever asked if I can bear it? I never wish to hurt you. Some things are stronger than we are. I cannot help myself. All these people, all going somewhere. Why do they trouble? You can't escape from yourself. Why not turn out the lights when there's nothing more to be seen? Anna Karenina was called a beautiful failure. Hamlet was one of the triumphs of Olivier's career. In 1947, while he was producing, directing, and starring in it, Olivier was knighted by King George VI. At 40, he was British theater's youngest ever knight. From now on, they were Sir Lawrence and Lady Olivier. One is often reminded about uh, the image which they projected to the public at large of being this great romantic couple. Sir Lawrence and Lady Olivier, after their successful tour of Australia and New Zealand. Oh, the most glamorous uh, couple um, in England, anywhere, I would think. The great romantic marriage of these two beautiful people who were both, in their way, magnificent uh, artists. Famous personalities of the entertainment world included Sir Lawrence Olivier and his wife, Vivian Lee, seen here talking to Italian stars. The Oliviers. It was almost like being royal to be those two. They really were the kind of king and queen of the theatre. Through the years, they appeared together in a number of plays, among which were The School for Scandal, Antony and Cleopatra, and Macbeth. 
she always had, of course, to struggle with his huge shadow, and he was a very great Macbeth, perhaps the greatest one we'll ever see. She used her frailty and her beauty and her extremely tenuous hold on her balance in that part in a way that I've never seen anyone play Lady Macbeth. In 1950, Vivian accepted the role that would stand as one of the high points of her acting career, Blanche in Tennessee Williams' Street Carning Desire. She would draw on the very best of her talents. Also tested would be her personal courage. Streetcar, I remember Larry saying, she has worked and worked and worked. And he said once, perhaps I've pushed her too far. And I think the streetcar was probably the greatest mistake she made in, in, admit, in uh, uh, allowing herself to do the revival on the stage and then the film because it was all too near home and I don't think it could have been good for her at all. Are you sure you wouldn't like another? Well, well, maybe I will just take one tiny nip more uh, just to put the stopper on, so to speak. Now, then I don't get worried. Your sister hasn't turned into a drunkard. She's just all shaken up and hot and dirty and tired. I had no sense of, of it being extraordinarily personal, Waiter. the character of Blanche. Waiter. I would say she was a very determined person and a strong person in many respects. Uh, the fact that I was totally unaware of illness during the course of the making of the film uh, says something. The Vivian was one of those extraordinary actresses who uh, could read a script, say, oh yes, in order for this to come to life, this, 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 and this must happen. And absolutely pinpointed down to the last detail in terms of performance in her head, and then get up and do it. I don't want realism, I want magic. Magic. Yes, yes, magic. I try to give that to people. I do misrepresent things. I don't tell truth. I tell what ought to be truth. And if that is sinful, then let me be punished for it. Don't turn the light on. Some things are not forgivable. Deliberate cruelty is not forgivable. It is the one unforgivable thing, in my opinion, and the one thing of which I have never, never been guilty. For her performance in A Streetcar Named Desire, Vivian Lee won her second Academy Award as Best Actress. It had been a triumph. In Blanche, she exposed aspects of herself she had never shown before on screen or stage. Her fragility, her sudden dips into despair and desolation that in the future would become more and more difficult to overcome. In the years ahead, there was rarely a time Vivian was not working or preparing to work in radio, in films, in theater. The Olivier's toured and traveled together, and most often were under a constant public scrutiny. Incidentally, he won an Academy Award, and she won an Academy, Academy Award for different pictures, of course, but they both accomplished the same result. Was uh, uh, Gone with the Wind a surprise to you? I'd always wanted to play in Gondor, but I must say that when I was chosen, I thought I didn't really think it would happen. But I'd wanted it to happen for so long that... I'd never cast her as a Jezebel, would you? <laughs> Thank you very much. But by the early 50s, it became apparent that their marriage had begun to unravel. Vivian's mood swings were becoming more pronounced and more frequent. And for Olivier, the strain and the sense of helplessness were sometimes unbearable. He said Vivian had given him some of the most wonderful times of his life, and also some of the worst. With a manic depressive person, they're either very, very up or utterly down. And very often, in the up times, they feel they're strongest and that they can do almost anything. But what was touching was that when she behaved badly and in nursing homes, she made scenes and broke windows and attacked people. And she would write letters and go and see them afterwards when she got better and apologize and send flowers and everything she could do to show that she didn't really mean it. I do know that sometimes she had shock treatment, which she couldn't bear. But it must have been awful to know, to know that she had this shadow hanging over her. 
belief that she was married to the greatest actor that ever lived, that never left Vivian. Olivier's star continued to rise, but for Vivian now in her 40s, the roles were becoming more limited. In 1956, they took their production of Shakespeare's Titus Andronicus on tour through Eastern Europe. Olivier was a major success as Titus. Vivian's role was comparatively minor, but not so her achievement. When he and she played Titus Andronicus, she was at her very worst, but in performance, she never, never failed. Vivian insisted on remaining with the tour, even though she experienced a number of severe manic attacks. On the return to London, her stability was to be further tested. The St. James Theatre, on which Olivier had taken a long-term lease, was about to be demolished. And so there was a demonstration. We all went along with her. I hope you will succeed in your defense of Mr. James's theatre. Though as a parliamentarian, I cannot approve your disorderly method. The problem was that when she got into the House of Parliament, she started shouting and screaming and, and she had to be got away because she was, in fact, she was ill at that time. But ill health never caused Vivian to withdraw completely from the world. It was she who introduced Olivier to the work of the young playwright John Osborne. Osborne wrote The Entertainer for Olivier and Vivian was eager to join the cast. However, she was judged too beautiful to play Olivier's shabby wife. Instead, she was considered for the role of his daughter. But Olivier finally chose a new young actress, Joan Plowright. Vivian was too old. She relied on him in every way for everything, and, and then he was gone, and gone to a younger woman. Larry wanted to be supportive, but he got too tired. You couldn't keep the pace. When he met Joan, he met someone who was gentler. Brilliant talent, but gentler. It had been over 25 years since she first laid eyes on him. They had become the golden couple. The world had watched the rise of their talent and the growth of their love. But now it was over. It was bound to burn itself out, I suppose, in, in due course. It was burning so brightly. But um, their affection for each other never, never ceased, even after the, the romance itself had uh, burnt itself out. And now Scarlett O'Hara captures her Atlanta again. Of course, she's Vivian Lee, ever charming and lovely, adding her luster to the premiere... Things would be different now for Vivian. Of and yet, the there was always the promise of work. There was family. The birth of Suzanne's children meant she was now a grandmother. And there was Jack Maribel. She'd met Jack many long before when they were playing Romeo and Juliet in New York. I think everybody was glad when they decided to live together because she was so desperately unhappy about her breakup of the marriage. And Larry would ring him up and say, ask how she was and all that and be thankful. And, well, he was thankful for Jack, of course, because it worried him terribly and her illness worried him. But she was very tough with him because she was still in love with Olivier to the end of her life and always kept his photograph by her bed and his love letters and all that kind of thing. When she starred in another Tennessee Williams work, The Roman Spring of Mrs. Stone, Vivian's own anxieties about age and loneliness seemed to be cruelly dramatized. Your friend, the Contessa, is nothing but a female pimp for this table of handsome boys she sells to the highest bidder. I won't deal in that ugly traffic, and so she passes you on to someone who will. I had no idea that your mind was such a cesspool. And if it's become one, it's because of my association. 
You ought to leave Rome. You've ruined yourself here. Paula! I would not be surprised if the police refused to renew your permit to stay. But... Well, that's between you and the police, of course, but what I personally don't like is your dishonesty. Oh, I don't understand. I, I thought there was something... Of... I demand Yes, you demand a lot of things. You're so puffed up with being a great lady. For Tennessee Williams, it seemed inevitable that a woman like Mrs. Stone would finally give in to hopelessness. But not so Vivian Lee. In spite of continued frailty, she toured Australia in Twelfth Night. She did a musical, Tavarich, on Broadway and won a Tony Award. And in 1964, she starred in Ship of Fools, directed by Stanley Kramer. It was to be her last picture. I think that Vivian Lee saw in this role a chance to achieve somewhat late in her career, a moment of, of tremendous drama and to scintillate, really, with an interpretation of a woman who's drinking, who doesn't want to be the age she has arrived at. She had health problems. She was taking shock treatments. She was highly nervous. And despite her illness, uh, didn't let it intrude. She would occasionally go off to one side and actually be shaking master control of herself and come back to the scene and manage it and do it and then go back to the palpitation again. It was, it was something which is indescribable. What do your parents feel about you going to Europe? My mother's thrilled. You could see this, this great beauty and then when you got close to her, you could see the stains and strains of life in that face but that was still so, so incredibly childlike in its, in its beauty, I think. But there are people that grow older and there are people that age, but something in them, in their face, in their eyes, something remains a child. And I think, I think that was true of Vivian Lee. Behind those old eyes, you hide a 16-year-old heart. Is that what men really find attractive? Mm-hmm. I wish that I'd, I'd been able to, to see her in her life when she was happy and when she was doing everything that she must have done brilliantly because someone told me once that the way she put a dinner table together, the way she put a room together, the way she entertained made life a work of art. And uh, I think that was probably true. Forty-five years earlier, there had been another long voyage by ship, one a small girl had made with her mother from India to England. It was as if a circle had been closed. The child who so loved fantasy was now an ailing woman, but still courageous, still caring. I remember it was my wife and I had visited Vivian the day she died, as a matter of fact, and she seemed well enough. She was not uh, hopping around. She was sitting up in bed, having been quite ill for a bit, and she was arranging flowers in a vase that she had uh, um, beside her. But she was interesting to talk to and, and sweet and, and uh, the perfect hostess at the time. Larry had his own life elsewhere. And I broke the news to Larry that Vivian had gone. And I remember there was a very long, long silence. And he just seemed like their whole life was running through his mind like a speeded up um, film story. And he just sighed deeply and said, poor dear little Vivian. And that was it. The tuberculosis that had returned did not seem life-threatening. She was convalescing, though impatiently, preparing to open in a new play. It was in 1967 that Vivian Lee died. At 53, all the different moods and colors and experiences that combined to make up this unique woman were no more. She was gone, but I, for one, will never forget her. 